1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 39 through 44. I'll put it on the screen today for those who are in the house of the Lord. And the King James text today reads, All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for one star differeth from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. Amen. I want to talk to us for a while today on the topic, Understanding Glory. Hallelujah. Understanding Glory. If you'll bow your heads with me one more moment. King Jesus, Master of the Universe, Savior of lost men, lover of lost men's souls. Oh God, how we love you today, how we appreciate the presence of the Lord that comes down as we sing the old songs of the church and we celebrate the truths of your word in song. Master, right now is the most important hour. Now is the most important time for the Word of God must go forth. And more important than singing, more important than choirs and music and instruments is the Word that comes from the pulpit because it is this Word which can either challenge and change, inspire and uplift, or it can leave us hungry, going home desiring more. But Master, today I believe, God, that you've given me a word from the church of the living God at this hour. And I know, God, if you'll anoint your messenger, if you'll allow your spirit to descend upon this place right now, oh God, if you, Lord, will bear witness to that which I am about to preach, if you will confirm in the hearing and in the heart of every individual, not just in this building, but those that are watching and those that will later watch by reason of the internet, if you will confirm God in their heart and in their spirit that what they're hearing is indeed a word from God, then, Lord, they can walk away from this message having grown and having their faith, uh, having been inspired. And, Master, today they will leave this place empowered by the truth of God, for it is the word of the Lord that declares that the truth will set you free. Master, save to the uttermost those that are lost. Reclaim the backslider, heal the sick, even as the word of God goes forth, filled with the Holy Ghost and fire. For we ask it in none other than Jesus, Jesus, Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God and amen. We often use terms, especially in the church, we'll use words and we'll use terms, you know, that we actually have very little understanding of. The word glory, I believe, is just one such word. We read 
The word over and over again in the scriptures and the word of God, often in various applications. And yet we really don't have a full grasp of the depth of its meaning. So this afternoon, my desire is that you will leave this message understanding glory. And that is the title of my message today. In Revelation chapter 21, verses 23 and 24, the word of the Lord declares, And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it. And the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. How in the world does the glory of God lighten the city, New Jerusalem? Isn't glory simply that which causes one to be renowned or praiseworthy? Does it not speak of intangible attributes such as honor and majesty? These things are not physical. They are not capable of generating light of any kind. So how is it that the Lord, uh, that the glory of the Lord shall produce light in God's city? Here again is where we see how context, you remember a couple weeks ago I preached the message, context matters. Well here again we see how context matters. Uh, contributes to understanding. When we need to understand a term, <coughs> we often must carefully examine the context around the term's usage to fully glean its definition with clarity. In our primary text, the Apostle Paul speaks of the sun and the moon having each their own glory. In this context, he refers to their level of radiance or the brightness by which they, uh, which they generate. But by the same token, one must take into account the fact that the sun shines bright in the daytime. Whereas the moon shines brightly at night while standing against a darkened background, the dark sky. So each not only shines, but does so within the context of the environment in which they appear. So the sun is bright as it appears visible and glorious in the full light of day. After all, is not the sun the source of our daylight to begin with? But the moon, while bright in appearance against a darkened sky, would scarcely appear at all in the light of day, but requires the night sky in order to be seen clearly. Am I telling the truth? Now you can see the moon in the, in the daylight if, if uh, everything is placed just right in the sky. There are times you can kind of see the moon a little bit, but it doesn't shine, it doesn't radiate no. in the daytime. In order for this, the moon to be seen radiating and bright and shining, it has to be against a dark backdrop, the dark night sky. Oh my goodness where we most clearly are able to define glory as it is used in our primary text is in its use in demonstrating contrast. Again, context matters. Uh, when you look at how it describes glory in terms of contrast, then suddenly the, what glory really means kind of comes into better vision. In 1 Corinthians 15, 43, we read, 
it is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. So here we understand because everything Paul talked about, uh, he talks about the resurrection of the dead. He said, it is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown in natural body, it is raised in spiritual body. Mm -hmm. So everything is exact opposite. Everything the comparisons he's making are it's so one way but it, it is raised an entirely different way. Mm -hmm. Okay? And the way in which it's raised is completely opposite to the way that it's sown. So then if it is sown in dishonor and it is raised in glory then it is easy for us then to understand that glory would be defined as the exact opposite, the polar opposite of dishonor. So therefore, glory is that which brings honor, that which brings praise. Hello now. Mm -hmm. Amen. So now listen. Glory then is that which brings honor, praise, or distinction. This then gives a whole new light, pardon the pun, to Revelation 21. It is the Lamb, God's provision of Himself as the Lamb of God, which brings honor and praise and distinction to God. Who else but God could have done this. Mm -hmm. No one. But the fact that he did do this is further cause for him to be worthy of having earned honor and praise. Hallelujah. Yes. So the fact that God himself did so great a thing as to humble himself and walk as a man so that he might go to the cross of Calvary for our sins, that is the source of his brightness or the light which emanates from his throne because the deed was so great that the glory is that great. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? Yeah. In John chapter 1, verses 1 through 10, the word of the Lord declares, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, listen, and the life was the light of men. Well, isn't that interesting? Because the Lamb is said to be the light of the city. Hallelujah. Oh, my God, have mercy. In Him was life. Oh, my God. And the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness. And the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. O oh, children, according to Revelation 21, the Lamb is the light. Eternity will bear witness to that which God did for humanity as the eternal reminder of his provision of a lamb will rest within his throne listen to me now as both a monument and the source of the light of his glory hallelujah 
See, the, the Bible said the Lamb is going to literally just merge into. The Lamb of God is going to walk into the throne of God. He's not going to sit to one side or the other side. He is literally going to sit in the throne of God. And when the Lamb is there, the Lamb now becomes a monument for eternity mm -hmm. to what God did for us. And it was so great and so powerful and so glorious a deed that it is going to shine like the sun. Oh, hallelujah. And that is the source of God's glory, is the deed that He did in order to redeem us and in order to save us. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. Listen. I'm not done. The monument, the Lamb, is the thing which brings the Lord glory and honor and majesty. Without understanding that God Himself became the Lamb, we fail to fully understand the concept of the light produced by the Lamb. Now listen. If the Lamb were a separate and distinct entity from the Father, His glory, or His light as it were, would only be that of the moon, a reflection of the glory of God. But His light is not contrasted with the light of the moon, but rather that of the sun. Oh, hallelujah. Oh my God. The sun is the source of all light in our universe. And the Lamb is not said to be a moon in God's eternal city reflecting the light of God, but He is said to be the glory of God and it is that glory which will light the city for eternity. Hallelujah. hallelujah. So the Lamb is not a moon. He is the sun. Thus, why I have my illustration up here today to help you understand. His light is not contrasted with the light of the moon. It is contrasted with that of the sun, which is the source of all light and not just a reflection of the light of another when viewed against the backdrop of a night sky. Hallelujah. The Lamb is not in figurative terms the moon, but rather He is the sun. Glory to God. So here we see the Lord God in Isaiah 42 and 8 declaring, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another neither my praise to graven images. God will not allow that which earns Him honor, majesty, praise, or distinction to be given to a graven image. He does not desire His glory to be associated with a man-made image of stone, wood, gold, or any other substance. He wants His glory to be associated only with Him. He will not use or permit the use, listen to me, of a moon or something that reflects His glory, but which is not Himself. Do you follow my logic today? Amen. When people build idols, they don't claim that the idol is their God, but they claim that the idol is representative of their God. Hello now. And therefore, any glory associated with the idol is a reflection of the glory of their God. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? So what they're building is moons. Hello. Every graven image, every image that's ever been created of any deity or any God, including Jehovah God, any image that's ever been made would only be an image that was capable of reflecting. Because it cannot contain, because it is not Him. It is something merely that reflects Him. 
But God said, I will not share my glory with another. In Isaiah 44 and verse 6, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. Now here's an example of what I mean about context matters. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. He's not talking about two different people here. But you could read it that way if you weren't careful. But then he says, I am the first, and I am the last. And beside me, there is no God. So obviously there aren't two people talking here, because he doesn't say we, he says I. Mm -hmm. All right? Listen, Isaiah 44, verse 8. Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time, and have declared it. Ye are even my witnesses. He's talking to Israel. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. In Isaiah 45 and verse 5, he declares, I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me. In Isaiah 45, verse 21, Tell ye, and bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this from ancient time? Who hath told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? And there is no God else beside me. A just God and a Savior, there is none beside me. Hosea 13 and 4, Yet I am the Lord thy God from the land of Egypt, and thou shalt know no God but me, for there is no Savior beside me. So we see over and over again, that the Lord makes clear He alone is in the heavens. He is the sun and there is no moon. Over and over again the Lord makes clear that His glory or the light which emanates from Him, which illustrates the source of His praiseworthiness, His honor and His majesty belongs to Him and Him alone. Hallelujah! He alone glories in being God and He alone glories in being our Savior. He does not send the moon to reflect His light or glory. But He does it Himself. He goes Himself so that He alone may be credited with that which earns and brings Him said honor, praise, and majesty. Hallelujah. In 2 Corinthians 4 and 6, For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts. Listen. To give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God, where? In the face of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So the light of the knowledge of the glory of God is found in the face of Jesus Christ. The glory of God is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. But God does not share His glory. Hello now. God does not permit a moon or a body of any kind or any sort to reflect His image or His glory. So then God Himself must be seen in the very face of the man, Jesus. Hallelujah. 1 Timothy 3.16 And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Godliness meaning everything that pertains to God. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, 
seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. <laughs> we know he's talking about Jesus. We know that. The description clearly is speaking of Jesus. In John chapter 14, verses 6 through 11, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very works' sake. Jesus Christ is the way and the only way to God because He is the very physical manifestation of God. We cannot find God without first finding Jesus Christ. In finding the man Jesus Christ, we find the very image of God himself. But not an image made of stone or gold or wood, but an image of flesh and blood prepared by God himself for God himself to occupy. And not just for God to use to reflect His light and His glory. God, the sun or source of light, will not allow a moon to reflect or share His glory. So He did not create Jesus to be a reflector of His glory like the moon is a reflector of the sun. No, 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 no. He created the Jesus Christ to be the vessel in which he himself would occupy and he is the light remember what i said about the word being the lamp and the spirit being the light amen so you see it all plays together it all comes together isaiah 9 and 6 declares for unto us a child is born unto us a son is given and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called, now listen, Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. But now, I don't know how many times I've read that verse in my life, and you almost, you almost slide on past wonderful because wonderful, the term wonderful, well that just implies that he's going to be so sweet and so nice and so precious and, and so kind and so generous and so loving and so compassionate, right? Mm. Wrong. Mm. That's not at all what this term means. Listen. <laughs> Why is the Messiah to be called or known as wonderful? Simply because he is so sweet or kind or compassionate? No. Listen. He is called wonderful <laughs> because he is a wonder. Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> he is unique and special in such a way as to inspire awe and wonder. Mm. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, do you see how that term takes on whole new life now? Mm. 
-hmm. Understanding that, that uh, then the nature of God's glory, we now understand the wonder that is all God did for us. And we see much more clearly the meaning of the words we read in Philippians 2, verses 5 through 11. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. He went from being God to making himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. You have to remember, the death of the cross was torture. That was a torturous death. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, and there's that magic phrase, to the glory of God the Father. In this passage, all of the principles we've today looked at are expounded. Firstly, God Himself did the work of salvation as our Savior. Having done so incredible and unique an act, as to take on human form and humble himself so as to appear a mere creation rather than the Creator. Mm -hmm. Secondly, that in doing this, he gave himself through this physical man, Jesus, a name that is above any and all other names. And thirdly, that one day every human being, every angel, every demon will bow before him and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And in so doing, will glorify the Father, God himself. Because God does not permit the presence or the use of any object, any body, or any person to reflect His glory, He alone is glorified by that which He alone has done. So when we confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, we confess that God indeed was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. We confess that Jesus Christ is God, and in so doing glorify none other than God the Father himself. Hallelujah. This confession is nothing less than a clear and distinct recognition of the Lord's personal, physical involvement in the bringing of salvation to a lost humanity. Oh, hallelujah. Yes, amen. Nothing in this world makes more clear the role of our God as our Savior and Redeemer than does understanding glory. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. hallelujah.